July, and so I pulled out a call to, to the staff, and I said, you know, all of us have these talks that we go around the world giving, but very rarely do we give talks here. And so I thought, so it turns out we filled up the June and July schedule, so you'll see a lot of GL scientists, which is going to be a lot of fun. I even got uh, convinced, well, I never thought this was possible, but Peter Meeson's going to actually give a talk here, which is incredible, outstanding. Um, so in any case, this is a talk I, I gave, actually, in Osaka University. Um, a little while ago, and it's, a, it's got some variations of a talk I gave in Hokkaido in February, and I thought that it was a little bit broader than the other talk I just gave in Zurich, and so I chose to talk about this one. I waited to the last second to decide which one to go with, but I thought I'd do this. Um, and I have a number of collaborators, so in alphabetical order, there's Connell Alexander. Interesting enough, I started this collaboration with Connell almost 21 years ago when I applied for a position here, and I didn't know I was going to get a position, but I met Connell. And uh, we developed it. He said, well, you know, maybe they won't hire me, but let's go collaborate. And off we went. And it's been great. Um, and Marilyn Fogel and Yoko Kebukawa and Larry Nittler and Akari Buta and Ian Wang, all at uh, CIW, and Rhonda Stroud. And I'll show you some of the collaborative work we've done with her. And David Kilcoyne, who has been a longtime collaborator at Advanced Light Source. Um, now, when I was giving this talk at Osaka, I felt like I had to give them some sort of background because I was giving a departmental seminar. And so I, I said, you know, why do we study these things? And so I felt like, well, humans naturally question the relationship between our existence on Earth and the origin of Earth. And so at the Geophysical Laboratory and other places, there are quite a few scientists study the origin and evolution of Earth. They, they want to understand this, they want to understand how the Earth formed. And so Faye is an example of somebody who wants to understand what's special about this planet. And then there are others, uh, actually here on campus and others, who, who study more generally the origin of planets. And so, of course, they have to ask themselves, uh, John Chambers being an example, you know, for what matter did the Earth form? And then there are a number of us uh, who study the primitive remnants of matter from which planets form. And that's the focus of this talk. The idea is we're trying to, to say something about earliest history of the solar system. But the bottom line is all of us are attempting to understand the fundamental nature of our solar system. And we're basically asking this question because here we are. You know, so why are we here? Uh, so that's, that's the driving force. 
Um, so since not everybody does this, this is the general talk for the general audience. Um, so primitive solar system objects, why study them? Um, and what are they? Uh, so the more common of these are the chondritic meteorites. And they're a group of meteorites that have up to a two weight percent organic solids, uh, which is, is huge. It's incredible. And we have the interplanetary dust particles. Uh, they're up to 44 weight percent carbon. And then we were very fortunate to have a successful NASA mission to Comet 81P, Build 2, which collected particles. And we were able to analyze those. So we have the genuine particles directly from a comet. And so the question we ask is, what is the origin of extraterrestrial organic solids? Um, does the existence of such carbon form us anything about early solar system history? Obviously, I think it does, because I've been working on it for about 20 years. Um, and before I go any further, when I say organic solids, we refer to this as insoluble organic matter. So throughout this talk, you'll see IOM, IOM. And what I'm saying, these are the organic solids that we're going to focus on. Hi, Matt. <laughs> I looked at this and said, whoa, Matt up. Um, so Scott Shepard gave this to me a long time ago, but I never ceased to, to, to stop showing it because I think it's so incredibly cool, which is uh, a sort of a primitive object's view of our solar system. And so what you have here is the Kuiper belt. So the innermost orbit of a planet is Jupiter. So you can't even see the inner part of the solar system in this diagram. And the outer, here's Pluto here. And this is a large a binary Kuiper belt object out here. And then the Kuiper belt object extends out to maybe 50 AU. But what's remarkable is you take this entire object, which is huge, and you embed it in the larger view of the solar system. That little rectangle is this rectangle. And this is the Oort cloud, which extends out hundreds of thousands of AUs, you know, actually extending beyond light years away from our, our central star. And so the key here is primitive chondritic meteorites come from within the inner solar system between Mars and Jupiter. So they're very, very close to the sun, relatively speaking. Comets come from either the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. They're very, very far away. And so from a distance, it appears reasonable that IOM that you find in comets and that you find in chondrites would have very different origins. And I'll show you that one of the, the more important discoveries we've made is that that doesn't seem to be the case. So this talk has three parts. Part one, I'll explain how we learned what IOM was at the molecular level and how that led to experiments in the laboratory to show how it's made. Part two is uh, how ion particle morphology shape matters. And particle shapes in polymers and ion tell you about process conditions. Therefore, there's history embedded in that. And the part three, what we think, now I should say, I'll find it. What I think and what Larry thinks and what Connell thinks are not necessarily the same thing. So I don't want to paint Larry into any corner. So Larry, when I say we, it's the royal we. Um, you'll have your opportunity to, uh, to, to debate me, which I know you will. Um, in any case, so these are my views, disclaimer. But, um, and so I think there's a very interesting relationship between uh, deuterium isotopes and, for that matter, carbon and nitrogen isotopes in regards to solar system history. So part one, the methods employed in this talk are solid state nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and scanning transmission x-ray microscopy. Um, and I would argue or acknowledge that these are not mainstream geoanalytical tools, so I need a little bit of introduction. Uh, so method one, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR. Uh, Fuad Terra, who's also in the audience, thank you, Fuad, uh, developed the principal methodology by which we can separate organic solids from the silicate matrix in the spectacular. So we can take this beautiful meteorite get rid of all those nasty minerals, and we're left with this beautiful, pristine, almost pristine black powder, which is IOM. And then, in this state, we can analyze it using solid-state nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. All I'll say about it is NMR is an isotope-specific stimulated radio emission spectroscopy, so we measure a signal in the time domain for a transfer that, and you get a beautiful spectrum. Of, in this case, it's a C13 solid-state NMR showing carbon in different electronic environments, different bonding environments. Um, just as a matter of background, most elements in the periodic table have isotopes that are NMR active. So every one of these, basically any one of these elements has isotopes that are NMR active if they're colored. So you see that the periodic table is very, very rich. And just as a matter of background, although it's not common, we've been doing this now for over 16 years at the Geophysical Laboratory. And I'm just highlighting the silicate studies. We use all these isotopes. The ones in blue are, are ones that we plan to study. In paleontology, paleoclimatology, we had studies this isotope systems, cosmic chemistry, we're talking about today. Here's a series of isotopes. We can do O17. I'm interested in doing that. We can also do xenon 129, geobiology, and so forth. So it's, it's a very, even though it's not a common technique, uh, I would argue that it should be, because it's very powerful. 
So this is an NMR spectrum of organic solids, or IOM, from, extracted from the Murchison meteorite. And I like to say the Murchison meteorite is like the E. coli of meteorites. It's, it's, it turns out it's better than E. coli because it actually is a really perfectly positioned meteorite for understanding the broader suite of meteorites. The bottom line is here's an NMR spectrum of a relatively complicated solid organic compound. And what I'm showing you here is that the broad <laughs> lines that you see here it's not, any relation, it's, not, it's not an issue of resolution limits for my NMR or our NMR. Rather, we're just looking at its chemical complexity. So by and large, you see most of the carbon is in this peak. And this is aromatic carbon. So it's like a benzene ring or something related to that. And you see various shoulders that correspond to different bonding environments that carbon finds itself in. So the bottom line is Murchison is mostly aromatic carbon. And it has lots of what we call polar functional groups, uh, carbon bonded to oxygen. So, now the nice thing is in NMR, we can we're also work in multiple dimensions. And I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but the point is we can do a time one, inquire a signal in time two, and we can get a two dimensional signal in time time space and do two Fourier transforms. Two Fourier transforms to get a two dimensional spectrum. It can give us a huge amount of information. And this is my friend uh, John Montine, who makes these beautiful little magic angle spinning sculptures, but I'm not going to show you that now. Um, so, in any case, uh, in this particular experiment, we set out to do this. It took us five weeks uh, of, of acquisition because the signal spread out over, over time. The signal noise is difficult to acquire. And at the end of the day, I was somewhat disappointed. They didn't seem to tell me anything that I didn't know already. However, I decided to look at one region of the spectrum of highlighted in red. And a very famous player in cosmochemistry, Rio Hayatsu, had concluded the basic monomer of this, this complex IOM polymer was compounds like this. We call it alkyl phenol. And so I said, oh, great, I'm going to go where aquaphenol is, and I'm going to show that, that, in fact, he was right. When I did this, this is what I saw, aquaphenol being red. And what I saw in this region here is this very symmetric peak in blue. And while it might seem like a trivial difference to you, it turns out it's actually very significant. So what we found is that Iowa does not have a lot of aquaphenol. And I can explain to you later why Rio made the mistake he did. Uh, but in fact, it has a lot of a somewhat related electronically group called the furan. And it turns out that was critically important. So with many, many, many NMR experiments over many years and a huge selection of, of organic matter from different meteorites to study, we found for at least Murchison, about 27% of the carbon is represented by highly branched aliphatic carbon, highly substituted. About 25% is furanic structures, 33% very small aromatic rings, very highly substituted, maybe 9% carboxylic groups or esters, and about 6% ketones. There's no way that I could draw you a structure, unique structure based on this. This is as good as it gets. Although people will publish these in the literature and people say, oh, this is the structure of IOM. It's ridiculous. Uh, but within this, there are some significant clues to its origin. Um, now, I'll get into the second method is carbon X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy, or carbon zanes. Um, it's a very powerful tool that works, actually, the back so 25 nanometer spot size on a really good day, probably 40 nanometers typically. High energy resolution. You can work with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, K edge. You have to microtome samples or focus ion beam mill them, uh, but you can do that fairly readily. This is a picture of the advanced light source from outside. So the ring is down here, and you're looking down on it. Um, again, this is not a very common geo facility, but neither is NMR, uh, but it should be. And these are some of the applications that we've done using microzanes. Um, in this case, the advanced light source applied to paleontology, cosmochemistry, geobiology, and microbiology. There are some uh, new variations on the theme. So where we started out with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, we could easily do iron and titanium and vanadium and manganese. But now with the new variations, we're doing nickel and copper. We can do magnesium, sulfur, phosphate, sodium, calcium. But this whole periodic table is opening up. It's, it's pretty spectacular. So here's a picture of the uh, X-ray microscope that we used at Advanced Light Source. And this is Hikari Buta many years ago. Um, she was a postdoc at the Geophysical Laboratory, uh, first as a fellow and then as a JSPS fellow. And actually, the microscope sits right over here, but it just looks like a silver box. Uh, the core of the spectroscopy is very simple. It's that the 1s electrons are not involved in any bonding whatsoever. Uh, they don't even know they're in a bond, basically. They're interacting very strongly with the nucleus. However, if you excite these with resonantly, with soft x-rays, at the ionization, you know, critical ionization energy, you can promote one of these electrons into the anti-bonding orbitals, which are unoccupied. In the anti-bonding orbitals, basically now that electron knows it's in a bond, and it will, it will report that as, as an absorption feature. And I'll show you how that works. 
So for example, this cartoon, we're using benzene as a cartoon. If we photo excite this poor little electron to 285 electron volts, plus or minus a couple, you'll find itself in one of the first unoccupied pi star orbitals, and you'll have a strong absorption band. So that's a signature of, of pi bonding, but you're looking at the antibonding states. And a slightly higher energy, 289 electron volts, you get to the second higher energy uh, pi star. So that's a very simple approximation of what's going on. It's a little more complicated than that because this simple model doesn't explain that peak, or that peak, or that peak. But uh, that's the core of it. So a number of us were participants in the Stardust mission, uh, which turned out to be a remarkable success. Went out, circled around the uh, solar system, eventually passed through the, the, the trail of a comet, collected comet particles, made its way back to Earth, plummeted to Earth, dropped this canister, and was collected. And it was collected in these particle trays. Um, so aerogel was a capture medium, so on and so forth. So here's a picture of a comet particle looking through the aerogel. And the question is how to analyze these. So here's, again, some terminal particles. Here's the edge of the aerogel. You see the particle comes in, sort of explodes, and the terminal particles project down to, say, several millimeters into the aerogel collector. And so the terminal particles turn out to be pretty interesting um, for their inorganic chemistry. And uh, so here we're mapping oxygen, iron, and calcium using the standing transmission X-ray microscope. And here's a composite. So you can see lots of oxygen. You can see the little blue lips here. You can see them there. These are iron sulfide grains, which is fascinating. And then there's a calcium-rich region down here. And what we're looking at is actually very high temperature um, mineralogy from that's consistent with the inner solar system, which was extremely surprising. And so I like to say this, this is a, a particles record of an incredible journey, because presumably these mineral grains formed in the inner solar system. They then migrated out to the Kuiper belt, where the uh, grains accreted essentially into a planetesimal, sat out there evolving for how many, four and a half billion years or so, until some perturbation occurred, such that the object, the planetesimal that they were part of, uh, was perturbed, fragmented, and this comet then made its way back into the inner solar system, where it was collected by our spacecraft and then taken back to Earth. So, I mean, you won't get a better journey than that, I think. Um, so the organics, it turns out, were largely formed in these regions, or at least, at least when people sectioned these regions and gave us the sections, this is where we found organics. And they were a really strange group of people, and there's I mean, particles, and we still <laughs> don't really understand what's going on. Um, this one is particularly peculiar because it looks like it's highly porous. Uh, it's embedded in epoxy. This is a strange looking little wiggly thing, but it actually has a, a silicate grain in the core of it, very organic rich. Bottom line is we, we collected carbon zanes in all these different uh, particles, and we compared this with an interplanetary dust particle here, a primitive chondrite here, a more evolved, thermally evolved chondrite there. And you see a lot of complexity. And that's all I need to tell you at this point. It's, it's nothing really systematic seems to be occurring here. There's a lot of chemical complexity. Um, here I've highlighted a number of different peaks that I would correspond to different functional groups. So the question is, how did these compounds form in the solar system or perform molecular cloud collapse? Now one of the things we can also do is we measure oxygen to carbon ratio and nitrogen to carbon ratio, which is a very handy thing to do when your particles are at sub-micron scale. And when we did that, we identified these are, so this is Connell and Marilyn Fogel's work, and it's just a couple dots here, but they filled this in with probably hundreds of meteorites by now. This is the full range of what you would find for chondritic organic matter, IOM. Uh, so up to, say, five nitrogens per 100 carbons, and maybe up to 24 oxygens per 100 carbons. And what we found was the part, comet particles were richer in nitrogen and oxygen, and there seemed to be two groups that were distinct, both in their molecular spectroscopy and in their elemental chemistry. And so the question is, is there a trend here? And I looked at this back in 2008, and thought I saw a trend. And what I saw was basically an apparent evolution where the loss of this peak, which is an alcohol, and the corresponding growth of these two compounds. This is, an, we call it an ene carbon, double bonded carbon. And this is a double bonded carbon proximal to a ketone. And so clearly it seemed like as this dropped, this went up. And that was familiar chemistry to me. So it struck me that what we were looking at was degradation of, of sugars. And so that immediately stood out. He said, well, a second, we've got furans in our NMR. Our zanes are saying we've seen degradation of sugars. And so it suggested to me that maybe everything that we're seeing was linked through the polymerization of formaldehyde. And so the scheme here is that formaldehyde is about the simplest way you can imagine of getting a complex sugar. So in sequential series of what we call them alcohol condensations. 
you can make your way here. This sort of structure is representative of the most primitive of the stardust particles we've analyzed. Now here's furan, very abundant in our salsate MR, and so this gets us out to sort of more processed, if you will, of the stardust particles. And then, and then if you get out to chemistry like this, now you're looking at the kind of chemistry that we see very well represented in the C13 salsate MR of, say, Murchison and other mediums. <coughs> so, so all of this seems to have a chemical connection, at least on paper. But one could argue that these simple reactions are just what you need to derive the normal chemical complexity that you see. They can happen, they give you complexity, they can occur at very low temperatures, and they're naturally occurring, like Iowa and Thomas and Chondra, asteroids. Excuse me, George, yeah. what sort of equilibrium constants do these kinds of reactions have? Well, aldol reactions are reversible, but what happens is they don't tend to reverse because very often when you condense, say, you know, uh, an aldehyde with a a, a, a partially acidic carbon somewhere else, you typically have an elimination reaction that is very hard to reverse. So uh, it, it's, it's a really good question because if they were fully reversible, nothing would, interesting would happen. So, and so I'll show you exactly how that works. So what we did was, it's nice chemistry on paper, but does it actually work? And so what we did was we basically did the experiment in the laboratory. We started out with a moderately basic solution of formaldehyde with a little bit of glycohaldehyde. Um, and Instantaneously, it turns strongly colored, black particles start to sediment out, eventually it's, it's completely opaque, and at the bottom is filled with some black stuff. So we, we take off the solution, we dry down the black material, and we do C13 salsate MR. If we do this experiment at 50 degrees, and this is the NMR spectrum of Murchison, you see the same types of functional groups represented. I just kind of one, two, three, four. I'm trying not to get too in depth with chemistry, but I'm happy to answer any questions. But the point is, so you see the same kind of chemistry uh, represented, but the relative abundances are very different. However, if you heat it up progressively, by the time you get to 250 degrees centigrade for four hours, you're starting to see a spectrum that's very close, not identical, but very close, and certainly extremely closely represented in terms of carbon in the same types of bonding environments. And so then we applied Zanes to this. And you could argue that Zanes doesn't nail it. I, I think it does a pretty good job. So here are two stardust particles. This is what I call the very primitive stardust particle. It's essentially pure polyalcohol. This is, I would say, more evolved stardust particle. So it has some ene carbon, some keto carbon. These are two of the, t uh, the formaldehyde polymers that are, that are now evolved away from formaldehyde, these black solids. They have one, two, three, the same three peaks that this one has. This is Murchison, one, two, three peaks. And then these are interplanetary dust particles with things collected by other people. And what you can clearly see is that for example, this spectrum and that spectrum are almost identical. So I would argue that if they are almost identical spectrally, then at least at the functional group level, these materials are essentially identical. Whether there are subtle details in the way the structure is put together, Zanes or NMR can't tell us that. So, so you're looking at the Zanes and the MR, and uh, looks like to me is 250 looks a matching with. Uh, yeah. Uh, So, so, so Zanes is very subtle. So while these look superficially very similar, in fact, the relative intensity of this car, uh, aromatic carbon is about a factor of two of this. So actually, Zanes essentially hides a lot of the chemical complexity that NMR does. You would always rather do NMR if you could do it. But with these tiny little Sardis particles, the only game in town is Zanes. So we do a lot of work trying to, if you will, sort of understand the Zanes spectra so that we can see. So what I'm saying is these look very similar, but they're actually fairly significantly different, particularly in the quantity of this carbon. The other thing about NMR, which uh, I, I didn't want to dwell on, but I could talk about NMR for, for years if you let me. But uh, uh, Zanes, of course, like most spectroscopies, is subject to uncertainties about all the, uh, sort of, it's, it's, the absorption intensity, it's not something that you can predict a priori. So it, it's related to essentially a number of factors relating sort of the transition dipole matrix element magnitude from a ground state to excited state. With NMR, the beauty about NMR is that all carbon is the same prior to the absorption of the RF radiation. So it's, if it's done right, 
it's absolutely quantitative. You don't have to guess about oscillator strengths for various transitions. Whereas in FDAR, or Raman, or, or Zanes, you, you need to know the fundamental oscillator strengths to understand what this means. But here we're talking about the same function group, and this is essentially twice the magnitude, well, that's twice the magnitude of that. And this is way bigger than this. So it, there are big differences, but they're hiding. So to be clear, when I say we, I don't think Larry is saying this, but I, I'm saying this, is that uh, we have identified a way of explaining the origins of organic solids in both comets and carbonaceous chondrites, and we can show, I believe, quite confidently that these two reservoirs of carbon look very, very similar. And therefore, if they look identical, they probably have the same origin. So the chemistry looks really promising, but the environment requires liquid water. Uh, so all the chemistry that I've shown you is, is occurring in a liquid medium. Now, that's not a problem for carbonaceous chondrites, but it, it, it gets people a little bit upset when I start talking about wet comets. Um, and it's for sure, as I said in Osaka, this is not a popular view. Uh, even to this day, I would say the majority of people prefer cold molecular cloud chemistry. That is the popular model. So the question is, which model is correct? Maybe neither. Uh, so to give you an example of the popular model, this is a, just came out three years ago. Uh, I probably could find a paper on this last, last week. If I, if I look for it. The idea is that there's a connection between basically carbon formation of all stars all the way to the formation of carbon in uh, you know, the, the reservoir, if you will, of carbon in, um, in the early uh, sort of star forming regions, you say, in the early, early solar system. So the idea is an AGB star, carbon rich star, will form these various little particles. And here they're saying this is an aliphatic rich particle with a slightly processed rim. Here's a larger one, the darker black is a more processed rim. And then here's a more facilitate with a little bit of organic solid on the outside. And the idea is that they're going to go from, from the, the, the outflow of this, this, this highly evolved HB star into the diffuse interstellar medium. They imagine a lot of processing going on, things happening. Then you start to collapse into the molecular cloud. Ices form around these grains. These grains start to accrete. This is my, I mean, I, presumably this is where you go to form your planetesimals, although they, they don't do that, so I put this in. And then you finally get into essentially the early solar system, and you got these different reservoirs. And so there's your, your continuum of carbon from one end to the other. So everything that, if their model's right, everything that we're seeing, so for example, I mean, whatever your model is, the IOM that I'm studying and we're studying is what we're talking about here, right? So, and say with Zanes or NMR. So that, that's the carbon we're talking about. So this argument, that way, I don't think this is very likely. <laughs> um, I'll tell you partly, so if you want to start thinking about, about particles in the interstellar medium, for that matter, anyway, uh, they are not going to be little spheres, right? They're going to be highly surface fractal objects because these are little tiny things floating around zero gravity, extremely low temperatures, and they're going to stick to each other, and they're going to produce these, this is a, a actually a numerical simulation of a, of a highly surface fractal grain formed through what's called diffusion-limited aggregation. So this is very well-trodden physics. This was really popular back in the 70s and 80s when people were looking at structure factors and trying to understand things. So here's another cartoon of a, what an interplanetary bus, I mean, an interstellar particle might look like. It's, it's an agglomeration of lots and lots of little particles, again, highly fractal. Now, in this particular figure that I, I stole from somebody, uh, they then envision ice sort of forming around this particle in, in this way. So there's an ice mantle on a little grain like this. But the reality is the ice would also be fractal. It wouldn't be smooth. This is 10K, right? So it's just you know, every water molecule is going to come and just, once it sticks, it's stuck. So, so you'd imagine that actually even the surface of this ice part would look surface fractal. I think there's no way of getting around it. So the popular view is, is that the organic solids that we're seeing in, in comets and in meteorites actually form through UV processing of ice mantles which have organics in them. And so in this cartoon, you've got basically a dusty cloud, you have nearby young stars, there's UV radiation is coming into the very edge of the cloud so it doesn't attenuate too much, and you start to do some interesting organic chemistry in this, this icy mantle, you see it's nice and brown, it's nice and organic, and here's your dust grain, and here's some now like little molecules, and you're making black aldehyde, which is great, because this is what we need to do our chemistry. So one of the things that uh, is favorable about this is, is that IOM as Connell and many other people have shown actually back into the 80s uh, and, and beyond, is, is tends to be isotopically very heavy in terms of hydrogen isotopes. And so deuterium is one of the least abundant, it is the least abundant stable isotope uh, in the periodic table. To get anomalously heavy deuterium values of this material suggests very low temperature sources. 
and that's that's absolutely true. And so it supports at some level a low temperature origin. Um, so the question is, is IOM pre-solar material? So that gets to my second part of my talk, um, which is chemistry provides the means, but process provides morphology. And so there's been some very interesting recent work that's been shedding light onto micro and nanoparticle morphology of organic solids and chondrites and IDPs. And so the bottom line is, I'm going to ask is, is, does morphology tell us anything about this? So here's an SEM image the Okokawa took of the organic, the formaldehyde polymer that we make in the laboratory. And you can see it's represented well by a collection of little balls. And it turns out if you go through those little balls, they're hollow little balls. And then here's a, a scanning transmission X-ray microscope image of a focusine beam mill section where it's just randomly sectioned through an ordinary chondrite. And in the middle of that section is a little sphere of carbon that's hollow in the center. So that's actually empty. And it's a beautiful little sphere. And so it's interesting what this might tell us. Now, Rhonda Stroud at one point gave me some samples to analyze for her. She had microtoned uh, another meteor called Bells. And here, what you see in her TE image is some of these hollow spheres. And then you see the spheres are sort of stuck to each other, kind of squashed, and sort of like, like a mesh of like pure organic. This is some of the formaldehyde polymer the Yoko Kiwakawa gave me. And again, you can see it's sort of squashed. And you can see there's a little solid sphere. And here, there are hollow regions here. And there's something going on. So, so you're seeing structures, or at least uh, physical morphology, very similar between formaldehyde polymer and what you see in carbonaceous chondrites. Um, so this is just a beautiful carbon, iron, and calcium map to show you that that's, in fact, a hole. So it's a hollow little ball. and um, how little balls to tell you something about how this thing formed. Uh, Rhonda Stroud and a former postdoc who sort of disappeared off the face of the earth, uh, but uh, we're analyzing the spectacular morphologies that you find in pure IOM with a TEM. And you see here, there's a crazy looking thing which looks like a number of little spheres, partially hollow spheres, that are sort of stuck together around a bigger hollow body with a hole in the center. And then this lacy mesh structure here is, is just truly amazing. And, and it begs the question of how in the world would you make something like that, right? So it's incredible morphology. And the question is, is this possible at 10 to 20 pay in like the cloud? And then the last thing that struck me, this is work that Larry uh, Nittler and his postdocs on Peters did and published in LPSC. And, and it is like the most incredible vein, if you will, or, or whatever. It's just a gigantic lump of pure IOM in a fib section, so this is all silicate around here, and all the light stuff is IOM. And it's got to be something like you know, many microns across. And it's all stuck together, and there's all sorts of fine structure. And to my view, when I saw this, I said, I, I find this really hard to imagine how you would form something like this in a cold molecular cloud. That's my bias. Now, it turns out that there's been recent studies, or fairly recent studies, of looking at the ultrastructure of organics in planar dust particles thought to come from comets. And there, too, you start to see these hollow little spheres, partially hollow little spheres, various round shapes, things stuck to each other. Um, morphology that looks fairly similar to what we see in IOM from chondrite, chondritic solids. So what is known is polymer shape is governed by physical chemistry. Uh, this is nothing. This, I mean, this is the whole basis of paint industry, right? That's why you get glossy paints or flat paints. It's all dictated on phase morphology. And what we're talking about here is in a polymer solvent system, where this dotted line is the glass transition. If you phase separate these systems above the glass transition, either through the binodal surface here or the spinodal surface there, you can tailor the structure of this material in all sorts of different ways. So this is spinodal decomposition polymer, this is binodal decomposition polymer, both above the glass transition. And here are some other interesting polymer shapes and morphologies that were tuned entirely by playing games with this phase separation. Now, notice this all occurs above the trans glass transition. So for polymers, nothing interesting happens below the glass transition. So what is the glass transition? Um, so the, the trick there is if you are up in Fairbanks, Alaska in January, and you decide you're going to repair something outside with duct tape, and you attempt to do so, it doesn't stick. And it doesn't stick because up in Alaska at very low temperatures, you go the, the adhesive has a glass transition, and below that, it won't stick. So you need specially formulated tapes. If you're in Alaska in January, you need to do this. So it turns out that uh, it seems trivial, but it's not. So for very polymer systems, if you can you know, frustrate polyethylene from crystallizing, it will eventually reach a glass transition at 148K. But you put some functional groups on it, like alcohols, and all of a sudden, glass transition goes way up. You put some carboxylic acid groups upon acrylic acid, and now we're talking 
500K for a glass transition. And so what we're talking about chemically is IOM is more like this than that. Now water has a theoretical glass transition 136K, or maybe it's actually been measured. CO has never actually been measured, but theoretically people anticipate 68K. So what I would say is the morphologies that we've seen are indicative of processes that occur above the glass transition. And I'm telling you the glass transitions have to be high for this material. So again, it doesn't point to my mind the morphology is something that's particularly cold or something that I would say is, is consistent with what I expect for chemistry that occurs in a cell medium. So a bunch of facts, but I guess the bottom line is for asteroids, wet chemistry is not a problem. Nobody has, you know, type ones and twos are essentially com almost completely altered anyway. So obviously it's an extensive water rock interaction with asteroids. The idea of comets seems to be less popular, although I would say that the mission, recent mission to Pluto has shown us that hyperbole objects are much more complex and much more dynamic than we ever suspected and seem to be continuously dynamic even to recent part of solar system history. Their main argument, and I don't have time to go into it, it but I've had to discuss it, is that comets and hydrous uh, IDPs never have ever seen liquid water. So that's the main argument. But I would argue, in my own view, that that's not generally correct and it's not inevitably to be expected. And I could talk about that. So part three, try to keep on time here, is I would say the surprisingly complex story regarding hydrogen isotopes or where I attempt to convince you that hydrogen isotopes may also point to a warm and wetter early solar system. But, as I said, unambiguously, large deuterium values is a signature of interstellar chemistry. No doubt about that, right? Um, and nobody argues that. The question is, yes it does, but why? So, to give you a little bit of background, Yoko Kemakawa, who was in my lab till just about a year or two ago, um, she and I were working on, on this laboratory-based IOM chemistry, exploring kinetics and a number of other issues, including isotope exchange. And we, we, we were thinking about this a little bit more, and we realized that we have an interesting constraint if this formaldehyde chemistry is right. What I mean by that is if you take a C chondrite, a uh, highly altered chondrite, the amount of water relative to, say, you know, organic carbon at, at, at a per carbon basis is on the order, of, uh, you know, at the atomic level, it's on the order of nine. So the water's in clays and the organics are in the formaldehyde equivalent. So, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a rock, but it's, it's a clay-rich rock. So it turns out that Yoko was able to show and uh, very, uh, in a very straightforward way that the maximum yield of organic solids you could ever get out of formaldehyde is 20% because of competing reactions that degrade. So, Turns out that if you look at interstellar ices, or for that matter, comets as a signature of what it, interstellar ices might be, typically the ratio of formaldehyde to water is about 100 to 1. And so when you apply that to a CI chondrite, you, you end up with the idea that, that there must have been 50 times more water in that chondrite than there currently is now. In other words, 98% of the water that was there is gone, and now you've got a rock. Uh, this actually makes perfect sense, because obviously you need more water than you've got if you're going to make a, a clay. Clays are made at the bottom of the ocean, so there's plenty of water there. So clearly there had to be much more water, but we would argue that a lot of water. So one of the things that concerned me was formaldehyde, when observed by astronomers and calculated by theoretical uh, astrochemists, uh, can be extremely <coughs> rich in deuterium because of this very cold interstellar molecular cloud chemistry can enrich formaldehyde enormously in deuterium. Uh, this is solar, this is the universe, this is Jupiter very depleted in deuterium, made in the big, big Bang, and it's been eroded ever since. So it's actually, we've got less deuterium now from the Big Bang than we started with. So, so this is some crazy enrichment up here. This is the Earth, and then you see, as I described earlier, it's well known that chondritic IOM and cometary water, in this case, tend to be heavy relative to the Earth and very heavy relative to the Sun. But all of these are actually considerably less heavy than some observed interstellar formaldehyde. So I got concerned that Rather than worrying about how these got heavy, if I'm right, I have a problem where to get rid of all that deuterium. And so, so I started worrying if this was a deal break. Um, now, Connell and Mount Fogel have been studying this for, for many, many years, and one of the biggest problems is there didn't seem to be any systematic relationship between deuterium abundance and hydrogen carbon ratio, which is a very reliable indicator of molecular structure. So this variation in H to C is a signature of processing. We can ask where and when. But there doesn't seem to be any obvious correlation. You can kind of look clusters here. These are ordinary chondrites. These are CIs and CMs. These are the more thermally evolved chondrites, so COs, etc. Um, so there, there's some grouping, but, but there's not really any serious correlation that we can see. Um, 
But there is in one particular meteorite, and I'll talk about it. Though. This is the Tagus Lake meteorite, and it's identified as different types of material from one object that came into the Earth's atmosphere as an intact object. Um, now, just to get back, so huge deuterium fractionation is predicted in dense uh, interstellar clouds. And so, for example, this little blue range is the entire range we worry about. We worry about Earth's water and the heaviest comet or chondrite. It's this little, little blue box. And these are values of deuterium to hydrogen ratio or on the per mil basis predicted for formaldehyde here, water at different temperatures. And so water can also be pretty heavy, but as temperatures rise, it becomes quite pedestrian. So also does H B plus. And the only other carrier for heavy deuterium is, is the CH2 plus. And so this is a, a classic but, but still valid uh, view of things from theoretical astrochemistry. So we're talking insane, 600,000 per mil, if you like, per mil basis. Um, very, very large values of deuterium detected. So as I said, molecular structure doesn't make much sense with deuterium uh, hydrogen bonds. So these are a bunch of different, meat, or I went from different meteorites, different CMs. And what you can see is while the molecular structures are boringly identical, the D to H values can change enormously. So this bell is huge difference, 3,000 versus 700. Um, and yet the molecular structure is exactly the same. So we have a good fortune, Larry and Connell and I and Yoko and a bunch of other people, a uh, big consortium, uh, started working on analyzing the organic matter in Tagus Lake. And immediately we saw these, they were broken up into fragments and they were given names, I, I, you know, 5, whoop, sorry, 5B, um, right, so 5B, 11H, 11I. The simple fact is we just stack these things up based on the obvious chemical evolution as we see it from C13 salt stain mark. Clearly we see a, a you know, decay of SB3 carbon here, a growth of SB2 carbon there. And the hydrogen NMR again we see starting out with SB3 rich hydrogen to finally an enrichment of SB2 rich hydrogen. So we get the sense of chemical evolution very nicely. I won't go into the details here other than to say we know what's going on and we know what's going on quantitatively in terms of this analysis. So. It turns out while hydrogen to carbon ratio is a very good indicator of um, molecular evolution structure, so is the fraction of aromatic carbon. And so when I say 5B has essentially the same amount of aromatic carbon as these two meteorites, the ion from these two meteorites appear, if I showed you, and I don't have time, the NMR spectrum of this compared with that, they look identical. Okay? So, however, the deuterium abundances are completely different. Similarly, if I showed you the NMR spectrum of this meteorite and compared it with these, very, very, very similar. And so there doesn't seem to be, again, any correlation between molecular structure and deuterium abundance. But there is this beautiful trend amongst the Tagus Lake clouds. So clearly there is some relationship in Tagus Lake between deuterium abundance and the fraction of aromatic carbon. Um, until we had this meteorite, we did not know this. So, so this is really, uh, it's been amazing. So, now, Connell and Marilyn Fogel did a really, really cool study, and it was so straightforward, I'm amazed that nobody ever did this before. And, and so what Connell and Marilyn did is they, they wanted to know what the deuterium abundance was in the waters in the clays, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, so they realized that we can isolate the organic matter from the meteorites very nicely. We have no evidence of isotope exchange during that process. So, they were able to measure the C to H ratio and the delta D ratio of the pure organics. Then they said, now we're going to analyze the whole meteorite, right? right? So we're going to get these, which we know independently. Now it's these plus water. And from that, we can assume that at the C to H of zero, that projects down to what the water has to be. And it, it did two amazing things. First of all, it showed, and Connell and Maryland showed this in their science paper in 2014, um, systematically that the water is depleted both to the organic solids, which is really cool. But they also show that the following, in the Tagus Lake class, this is the most least evolved, and this is slightly more evolved, and that's slightly more evolved, this very interesting trend. So clearly, as C to H there evolves with molecular changes in structure that NMR shows, you have this pivoting around these points, and you clearly see that the water abundance, the deuterium abundance is increasing. So in my view, this is most consistent with incomplete deuterium hydrogen exchange between water reservoir and organics. And, and it's remarkable to see that. So if that's the case, it leads us to be able to basically play some games with models. So we imagine, well, let's say the organic precursor of IOM started out at 5400 per mil, quite a bit richer than what you see currently. And what if water started out at solar values, very depleted? 
then we can basically fit what we observed for Murchison or this other meter at GRO and determine a water to organic ratio or organic is not high equivalence. And what we find is in both cases, the amount of water it would take to get these meteorites to where they are now through incomplete exchange is less than what we actually have in the meteor now. So that seems implausible. So then we say, well, let's make the organic precursor a little bit heavier. So we go to 20,000 per mil. Um, that's like uh, these really high hot spots that you would see with the, uh, when Larry does the nanosims and other work, you see 20,000 per mil hot spots. And do that again with very solar water. Now you're at least above the amount of water you had, so that seems physically okay. Now we're talking about 19, 29 to 19. So it's two to three times the amount of water currently present in the meteorite. And then finally, whoop, finally uh, we say, well, what if we, we go to sort of interstellar formaldehyde? In this case, on the lower end, 63,000 uh, per mil. How much what would the water ratio there be the water organic ratio? Now we're talking 98 to 66. So it turns out it's 7 to 11 times the amount of water currently present. But as I told you earlier, this is still way less than the 50 times the water I said might have been there if the formaldehyde chemistry was uh, correct. And so the question is, is this absolutely crazy? Well. This is what organic would have to be if we had 50 times the water. And it's actually well below what formaldehyde has been predicted to be in some theoretical calculations. So I would say, not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Certified, not insane. I don't remember that episode. But um, so the bottom line is, it seems that a very small amount of very deuterium-rich formaldehyde could be responsible for all the de deuterium variability in the solar system. And this led me at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference to, to do this, and boy did I make a lot of friends when I showed this speaker. Because I said, perhaps all of what we're seeing here is just D to H noise. Um, yeah, some people were really happy to have me present this. Uh, always making friends. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty here, and if you are pivoting off of two very, very different reservoirs, you know, it doesn't take a lot to move around in this space. So this is the very end of my talk. For those of you who have it. So the bottom line is the popular view is that particles in cold molecular cloud underwent a lot of processing, who knows how many steps, before it all accreted essentially into this meteorite that you have in your lab. Our, my argument is that actually I think a lot of the chemistry that we observe is post accretion, both in the isotopes, the synthesis of the organic solids. And meteorites and organics in particular clearly record a very rich history of the Earth's solar system. And I think most of it, well, the data lead me to believe that it's possible that most of what we observe is post accretionary that occurred within the interiors of planetesimals, both comets and asteroids. So I would say that primitive materials are maybe not so primitive. Um, the material certainly seems to affect warmer and wetter environments. Of course, this is going to occur in a planetesimal interior. It's not going to occur up in the exteriors of, of planetesimals. Um, basically, if we want to understand, whoops, if we want to understand the initial planet forming material, then we're challenged to basically understand how water would have changed the actual primitive matter. Because what we're studying in the laboratory, even IDPs, may well be somewhat or extensively processed. So in any case, I would say for sure, the more we know, the better we understand our own ignorance. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, these three amazing women uh, in particular, and uh, to go. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, yes, Larry. Well, since you're kind of calling me out and saying I would argue with you, I guess I'm kind of required to argue. With you, you must. I, would, you must. Um, I don't disagree with most of what you say. I would, I would say you throw out some straw men there in terms of the arguments against your model, and in particular. To say the main argument uh, against against the polymer chemistry is the issue of wet comets, that's half the argument. The other argument that um, I keep trying to get you to address is where is the uh, mass balance of the carbon. So when this stuff comes together, when you're creating the original planetesimals, we know from astronomy and the work, you know, like Jones and people, we know there's a lot of carbon in the molecular cloud that's in the form of an organic solid of some kind, some sort of solid carbon. We know that there is that there are other carbon-bearing ices, and not only that, that formaldehyde is only a very minor carrier of the carbon, the total carbon in the stuff that's coming together. So if you want to make all the IOM from the formaldehyde ice, what happened to all the other, the larger amount of carbon that was in that planetesimal to begin with? That's, so, so the simple answer, of course, is I don't know. Um, one of the things that, that struck me, has always struck me, 
You know, I have this beautiful sample of Yende that I inherited from my predecessor, and uh, you know, if I look at it, it's like I'm looking at his skull or something. But it's this amazing it's, material. I mean, it's it, and it's it's clearly a fully lithified rock, and you could kill somebody with it. It's, it's very strong, very tough, um, and you can drop it on the floor and it won't break. Uh, that has sadly happened once, but it didn't break. And uh, so I've thought to myself, well, you know, if this is a rock, it's it's undergone some sort of lithification process. Now with Yoko's work. If, again, if we're, we're correct about our hypothesis of formation mechanism, we're talking about the vast majority of the material that had been there is now gone. Now, where it went, I don't know. I, I, it caused me to, when we made this, or this, this discovery, if you will, I remember I was talking to Alicia Weinberger, and I said, you know, if we're right, the early solar system must be like geyser fields. Like these planetesimals be jetting water all over the place, right? So I asked her, do you see water jetting all over in primitive disks? You know, because she looks at disks. And, the interesting thing, she said, well, no, maybe we should look for it. Um, now, it might freeze immediately, right? It might just jet out like in Cetalis and immediately become ice particles and be very difficult to observe. But So what my point being is that methanol, we don't think is going to be able to do anything. Um, and so we think that it'll follow the water wherever the water goes. If most of the water is gone, that's where the methanol goes. Uh, hydrogen cyanide is the only other interesting molecule you can do chemistry with in a, in a common of year, or a comet or a solar isis, and they're for sure been detected. Uh, that material, you can make a polymer with it, but you will immediately hydrolyze into small molecules uh, because it's not stable in water. Whereas the formaldehyde polymer obviously is. It, it, it evolves molecularly, but it doesn't fall apart at all. Um, so it shares that characteristic with the iron. Now, lastly, I, it isn't true, actually, that we see complex. We, so if you look at different, I'm thinking of Yvonne Pendleton and her observations of 3.4 micron band in electric clouds. but when she goes to the fingerprint region of the FTR, or the IR spectrum, you don't see anything that looks anything like Murchison. So she does see aliphatic structures out there, but you don't see anything else that looks truly macromolecular. She acknowledged that in the 2008 meeting, that you know, when I get a good match in the, in the principal vibrational modes, I don't get any match at all in, in the IR. So the biggest argument with astrochemistry is been proven by astrochemists themselves, experimental astrochemists. So if you look at the very first papers by the Alan Dola group and whatnot, when they would put make ices in their cryostats of putative interstellar compositions, the one thing everybody agrees on is that the predominant molecule in those ices is water, by far. And every comet study you looked at is mostly water. They immediately showed and proved and published that you will form hydroxy radicals, and they will take part of it. So if you put in carbon monoxide, which is the second most abundant, molecule out there, and it will condense in those ices, you convert it to CO2. And so that chemistry, one argues sometimes, well, where does all the CO2 in comets come from? That could come from UV uh, uh, radiation of ices. So they couldn't get anything interesting to occur. So they, you know, they have this cryostat, so they said, well, what are we going to do? So finally, if they change the mix to, say, 30% ammonia, 30% methanol, 30% carbon monoxide, then you start doing some interesting chemistry. But I would argue that there's no such ice in our galaxy. Nobody's ever observed anything like that. And how you would get that kind of ice and somehow not get water seems incredible to me. So what I would argue that I don't think there's any evidence, really strong evidence that I'm aware of, that there's lots of very complex organic chemistry. There's very strong evidence light. for solid carbon in the interstellar media. There, it doesn't have to be organic. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is a large reservoir of the carbon that is in the forming planetesimal you're it's already an or quite carbon-rich solid. So, so you're absolutely, you're, I, sorry, I, you're absolutely correct. Um, there is no doubt that there, in the outflow of AGB, highly evolved AGB stars, there is a lot of carbon flowing out. I'm not talking about AGB stars. I'm talking about the interstellar medium. And well, read the Jones yeah, paper. He goes through the evidence. Uh, well, I, I, so where does that come from? That's what you're asking. I, I, I don't have. I'm not, that's not, I'm asking what happens to it on the planetesimal. I well, think you that's in principle destroy it in the molecular lab. Right? You can take. You're talking about like the ten percent amorphous carbon. That's yeah. In, yeah. So you would have to do something for George to be read. Right, you would have to do something with it in the dense molecular cloud phase to get it out of being amorphous carbon. Right. To somehow convert it to formaldehyde if he's going to make all this. Well, I don't know. I mean. There's making formaldehyde is not a difficult problem because people see it, they observe it, it's it's made, and people understand how it's made. So so Millar and all those can show you how that comes to be. Yeah. I, I think so interesting enough, when I got into this game, Alicia Weinberger and all astronomers would say, look, when we look at these discs, all we see is UV. Uh, we see uh, aromatics, 
polycyclic aromatic carbons. So how come we don't see a lot of these in our meat resin? I, so I don't know, we, but we don't. But then I looked into this a little bit, and there was an interesting theoretical analysis that argued that their destruction rate far exceeds their detection rate. So you're, you're detecting them as they're being destroyed. And so it turns out that within disks and perhaps within like your clouds, there are processes by which you can destroy these things. So I agree that, but I think that philosophically, what I think I feel is when we look at even the most primitive meteorite that we've got, we're actually looking at something that has fairly extensively been processed. So it's not the most, and that's all I'm trying to say. It's that, and I think the organic matter that we're seeing in there, which seems to be, well, we go on and on. It, there are cases where there are two different kinds of organic matter that was shown unambiguously by Brad de Gregorio, and that I don't have an answer for either. Um, that, that's an interesting result. That's what I was saying. That, let's hear other questions. <laughs> So, so I didn't really quite understand that this uh, in the last in this relationship. I assume that meteorite has the same came from the same parent bodies. And how, is is the process in changing this uh, <coughs> isotope composition? So is uh, well, so that's a really yeah. So so what's going on here, right? So why are these CRs so heavy, and why is Murchison, relatively speaking, so light? relative to Tagish. And um, so there's two possibilities. One is that they've undergone variations in incomplete isotope exchange. Right? So that's, that's the way I would probably interpret this. Uh, alternatively, there could be variations in the deuterium abundance of the organic precursors. Because the formaldehyde chemistry is going to go whether you, you know, you're at 10,000 per mil or 600,000 per mil. That, that, that doesn't really affect the outcome of that reaction. Um, so once again, I mean, I, these are early days. I, I can't say. I have interpreted this as, as being that the CRs are experiencing less hydrogen isotope exchange. So it's just simply, you know, these, uh, where are these models? But for the tannish uh, media itself, is uh, is there is inherently? Well, this is really fascinating. So so this object came in as. So it, it was really well observed because it was coming in, I think, at a very similar trajectory to a Russian missile. Mm -hmm. So all of our defense, radar defense, is basically looking in that direction for something to come, and they saw it come right in, and it basically hit this lake in Canada, you know, a frozen lake in Canada. But it was, it was clearly an object that was on the order of, I think, 10 feet in diameter. I don't know if they know the shape characteristics all that well. Uh, if Emma was here, I'd say it probably looked like a potato. Um, she could tell me what kind of potato it looked like. But, uh, it, but it, it, when it hit the atmosphere, it exploded, as these objects often did. And so it rained all this debris down on this frozen lake. And it was collected by a very entrepreneurial um, and relatively poor Canadian who lived up in the north and saw the value of this thing. He grabbed all these pieces, and he put it in his refrigerator, and then he waited. And he waited, and he waited Canada out. And they said, can we have some? And he's like, no, we're going to have to buy it. And I think Larry would know what he got for it. But he got a good retirement out of it, I think. Yeah, something a lot of money. A lot of money. $800,000 or something. But let me just, yeah, that's why I always say, in one of these things, I always say, thank you, Canada. But, uh, but, but thank God he did this because, as I said, up to this point, we just had these scatter plots. And so, we, Colin and I would say, you know, Colin, what does this mean? And I'd say, well, it means everything's scattered. It means there's no correlation, right? It drove us batty. Um, and then all of a sudden, this one meteorite comes along. So, the big question, and Connell and Larry and I and all the people involved, there's a huge consortium. We don't know why one object would give you this huge range to like your structure. I, I have a hypothesis, but now it's a bunch of pieces. If we could get uh, Chris Hurd and the Canadians to put the meteorite back together again, <laughs> then we would be able to see what's going on. But one possibility is that it's um, a branch of, right? It, it's, well, that is what it is. And, well, and petrologically, we know that there's actually petrologic right. correlations between the IOM and that to make perfect sense. Right, right. Well, there's another possibility, too. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, we know at this point it's a pile of rubble, and the rubble have different class, and they have different uh, characteristics. We do know that there's a very systematic relationship between what's going between this one, this one, this one, and that one, right? So, so it's a reporting process, right? There's different degrees of processing. I think that's significant. So it isn't just a, a random collection of things. It's, it's something that's telling us something, something profound. I think that this correlation, based on all of the data that Colin and Maryland collected, I mean, hundreds of samples, no correlation whatsoever, and all of a sudden, 
Whoop! I mean, that is amazing to me. Um, and uh, so I don't think it's fortuitous. So I, well, I took, what I like the idea was, imagine that you had a hydrothermal fracture zone through a planet Tesla. You would alter material quite extensively in the fracture zone. You'd alter it much less extensively to the margins of the fracture zone. And then what happens with these fracture zones on terrestrial systems is they tend to cement themselves back shut. So one possibility is we're looking at an object that basically is reporting sort of the, the localized channel flow of hot fluids. Um, but I, so that's, is it? Yeah, it's, but it's amazing. That sounds interesting. I mean, sounds. I mean, it also could be maybe porosity. If you're interacting water is from the interior to the to the surface, and what level of the interactions and that's represented. That's true. And yeah. this material, if I'm not mistaken, and, and Larry's actually seen the stuff. I think and Connell's worked with it. Um, I only see it when it's IOM. Um, it, I think believe this stuff is very friable, almost not even you know something you hold in your hand. Whereas this material here is actually it's it's like rattle, it's like bits and pieces of, of solid material. So for sure there's a difference in porosity. And um, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about uh, carbon isotopes? So you explain like, the DH variability in the solar system by uh, mixing between the solar component and maldehyde. Um, do you also make predictions for the variations in carbon isotopes that we observe in the solar system? Um, yes. And the carbon isotope story is a really interesting story. Um, the following sense is that most people, when they worry about organic matter in carbonaceous materials, they're very interested in the amino acids and the small molecules that you can extract. And they like amino acids, but for that matter, purines and pyrimidines, because they're molecules that life uses. And so it's, it's, but it turns out that that material is very, very low abundance relative to the IOM. I mean, just two vastly different reservoirs in terms of, of, of how much is there. Um, However, so when you look at the stick carbon isotopes of those very small, interesting molecules of amino acids, they tend to be very heavy carbon, like up to plus 160 per mil relative to uh, PDB. Uh, whereas the IOM generally is pretty terrestrial looking. It's pretty, it's about minus 17 for a lot of these things. Uh, now it turns out that Connell and Marilyn did a very interesting study after their hydrogen isotope study where they looked at the carbon study. And it turns out, and Connell can correct me if I'm wrong, is that almost systematically, so now they said, well, okay, here's the IOM carbon, what's the carbonate carbon? And what I think Connell found systematically was that the carbonate carbon is heavier. So there's a heavy reservoir of carbon in the carbonate. And now, how this arose is interesting. I, I was reading a study, a paper on this, um, just looking around for formaldehyde, and I came across a very interesting theoretical prediction. And at the very end, they were talking about kinetics, and they said, oh, by the way, they said, in our model, it turns out that carbon monoxide is systematically heavier than formaldehyde by some considerable amount. And so it, it suggests that we have representation of carbon in two different reservoirs and, and chemistries that are, are doing vastly different things. So um, now the question is, is there signatures of incomplete carbon isotopes? Yeah, there's a hint to that. There, there is. It's a, and so we're exploring, Juliana, my summer intern, is, is exploring the isotope exchange. Can, so if we get the kinetics right, maybe we can say something. Are there sure. alternative uh, ideas of how those interesting morphologies that you, um, that you said were from spinotal decomposition in the glass transition, the, those same morphologies could uh, be created at below 50 Kelvin? Really low Um I mean, people make spherules so I don't know how to put a temperature on it. So if you, if you like, take it, there's a, a paper that, that Larry showed me where people make these little spherules you, you know, in a plasma with benzene. That's hardly low temperature. Yeah, that was a very high temperature. <laughs> <process>. <laughs> so um, I mean, yeah, I showed this to a, a material scientist one time, these, these little spherules, and, I, and he said, well, obviously, they're made in a liquid because the spherical shape tells you that you're trying to minimize surface area with, with respect to, to uh, surface energy, right? And so. Now, the interesting thing is I was trying to figure out why do we have hollow balls? And it turns out that actually that also follows from, from decomposition, or by, you know, basically binodal or spinodal decomposition. And the idea there is that if the miscibility is evolving as the polymer is growing, right? So you'll have actually multiple binodal surfaces. So you may intersect the first binodal surface and you'll phase separate a, you know, a, a solvent saturated gel system. But then as the system continues to polymerize, in fact, it'll find itself 
once again approaching a new binodal. And at that point, it's going to expel the fluid um, in two ways. Basically, it's going to expel fluid out and it's expel fluid in. And so you would expect to form hollow balls if you had essentially this convoluted sort of uh, variation of binodal surfaces with degrees of polymerization. It's exactly what you predict. Good. Uh, thank Had you. Enough. Joe is going to be here for a while, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so if you have a question, obviously you can address to Joe. Um, do we have a lot? I think we do. Oh, okay. So, so join us for lunch. Come lunch until the sandwich runs up. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. You've got a lot of extra digits on that figure right name up there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you make these talks in Japan. I was just, just looking up thinking, why was that? Epic meter, I don't have such long numbers, and I remembered, oh, there's no zeros. It's just 9.56.